So today um, I'm hoping to convince all of you that uh, we should all be using uh, unit information in all of our data schema um, much more than we do um, in 15 minutes. So um, the word unit is actually quite overloaded in our line of work. Uh, today I'm really not talking about functional units or unit testing. Um, I'm not talking about identity elements that we use in algebras. Um, I'm not talking about empty argument lists um, or empty return values. Um, and I'm sadly also not talking about uh, funny pictures with chunky animals. Um, so what am I talking about? I'm talking about units of measure. Um, for instance, from science and engineering, we all are familiar with meters, kilograms, uh, and seconds. But uh, we also use a lot of units in software that aren't like that. Um, I mean, we do use time units for configuring things like latency. Um, but we have uh, memory units, uh, like megabytes, gigabits, etc. cetera. Um, we uh, express bandwidths in terms of megabytes per second, generally you know, units of information per unit of time. Um, we express things like throughput in units like queries per second or in machine learning uh, inferences per second. And in our clustering environments, we can you know, measure our cluster sizes in units of nodes or express scheduling rates in pods per second or just measure the you know, number of uh, volume claims in a system like Kubernetes. It's important to get units right. Um, possibly the most famous unit mistake in uh, modern history was the uh, Mars Climate Orbiter. Um, NASA wrote the probe software expecting a uh, rocket burn in uh, metric units, but uh, Lockheed Martin supplied the uh, um, unit in um, United States Freedom Units. And uh, the resulting discrepancy um, caused a $300 million space probe to basically face plant into Mars. Um, so, you know, most of us will never be responsible for lighting NASA's budget on fire. But uh, unit mistakes hurt us in other ways that are very real. Um, here I'm going to talk a little bit about a bug from the early days of uh, developing the Kubernetes backend for Apache Spark. And um, basically what happened was, you can see in the red up above, um, somebody was uh, setting a pod memory limit um, using, assuming like basically base thousand memory units. Um, the problem was the actual uh, numeric value had been computed in using the uh, base 1024 uh, memory units. Um, now, that's not really numerically a huge discrepancy. However, um, the Spark JVM had been properly configured uh, using the same value to use the base 1024 units. Um, and so what happened was eventually somebody's Spark jobs, um, the JVM was asking for more memory from the pod than it was configured for, and it was just enough to uh, crash a bunch of people's Spark jobs without a memory errors. Um, now, again, this is, um, oops, this is not like a $100 million mistake, but you know, people lost their Spark jobs, um, a bunch of engineers had to like, track this down and figure out what was going wrong, and you know, then fix it. So you know, it cost a bunch of real time, and as we all know, time is money. Um, so uh, what role do units play conceptually? Um, basically, they annotate raw numeric data. You can see here they're annotating a bunch of numbers. Uh, what does that mean? It means they define a bunch of operations that you're allowed to do with these numbers. Um, and then also they forbid certain things that are not allowed. Um, so to be more specific, um, it's legal to convert compatible units. Like we're all familiar with the idea that, you know, 10 minutes and 600 seconds are referring to the same amount of time. Um, and uh, more a little slightly more complex, a gigabit per second is actually equivalent to 7,500 megabytes per minute. Um, they also tell us things we can do algebraically, like you know you can actually add 10 seconds to one minute um, as long as you do the proper conversion first. Um, you know if you have like a unit of information per unit time, like this data rate, if you multiply it by a duration, you know what you're left with is just a unit of information. Um, other things are not legal. For instance, if uh, somebody asked you to convert 10 minutes into some number of bytes, well, that's not allowed. You, know, you, don't, you don't get to do that. Um, you know, algebraically, if I try to add like a number of pods to a number of nodes, um, again, I'm not allowed to do that because that's not a, not a thing. Um, so 
those of us in software, this might be sounding familiar by now. Um, these units are playing a role of data types. Like we're all familiar with data types, like these, you know, um, Boolean and string and numeric expressions, um, and are familiar with the idea that these data types forbid certain kinds of operations, like these ones on the right. Those are generally not allowed by the compiler unless you're programming in JavaScript, maybe. Um, <laughs> So what if, you know, just like our compiler can tell us, oh, look, we have, you know, an error here if you try to use this expression because the data types don't match. Um, what if we could do that same thing in a compiler with expressions involving units? Um, so I'm going to go back to our bug here. I'm going to play my game, find the unit types. Um, so in these expressions, where were the unit types actually living? Um, the first place is they were encoded in the variable name. Now this is useful for us humans, but as you can guess, to the compiler that means nothing. It's just a bunch of identifiers, you know, in its compiler database. Um, the second place it's living is it's encoded in the string value that's being sent out to the kube API. Now this does mean something at runtime uh, to the Kubernetes API. But again, you can see it's embedded in a string value, and so from the compiler's point of view, there's nothing it can get its arms around to tell you what might be wrong or right about your unit expressions. And so, in a real sense, the compiler is unable to prevent uh, the programmers from causing this bug. Um, so I wanted to explore like what it might look like um, to actually be able to put unit types directly into code. Um, here you can see that there's a quantity and it's got a numeric value and it's got a numeric type, but it also has uh, a type paired with that that expresses that it's the units of kilograms. Um, now you can see here, how all the code you're about to see is written in Scala. Um, how many people here know Scala? Show of hands. A few people. The rest of you, um, don't worry, knowing Scala is not the point. I just want to use these examples to show two things. One is you can do this with real code, with real compilers, um, and also just to give you a feel for what unit types allow you to do if you can actually express them. Um, so we can do some other things with this system I wrote. Um, you can just simply attach units to a raw numeric value. Um, you can take simple unit types and then use these little type operators basically to build up slightly more complicated types and uh, you can keep going. I think this is my favorite unit. Um, units of electrical resistance, they just have everything. Um, so what, what would this look like? You know, what would programming look like in this world? Um, let's suppose that going back to our bug, we had coded our, you know, system that called our kube API like this, where we say, look, write in a type, I'm saying I want megabytes, uh, base thousand. Um, and here it's a fake thing, so I'm just showing the value. Um, now suppose, like in the bug, somebody went and computed this using the base 1024 prefixes. Um, what would happen? Um, if I actually call this function using that value, you can see that um, in the output, it actually, the compiler automatically figured out that these were convertible and it used the correct conversion. So in this, you know, in this world, that bug would never have happened, even though there was a discrepancy um, between the expected and the actual computed uh, unit. Um, equally important, suppose somebody had like configured a unit of time somewhere, like this timeout value, and then somebody screwed up, you know, and tried to call it with the time value. Um, the compiler will forbid it. It also understands that these units are not convertible, and it literally will not even build your code. Um, so again, if these are just numeric values, the compiler would have been like, cool. Um, but here, it actually catches your error for you. Um, so this kind of system can like help make other software components work better. Like here is a um, config file. Um, you know, this happens to be like a light bends type safe config, but it doesn't really matter. You can see that what I've done is I've actually added unit expressions, like this hours here, right into the values. Um, what does it allow me to do? Suppose I had a sy system call, like imagine I could define a system call expecting certain units. So here's like, you know, a quantity of milliseconds. Um, and then I load 
you know, the log retention time, and I'm actually asking it for seconds, so it's like different than the hours it was configured. Um, and then I call the system. Um, you can see that both on the, both on the, um, you know, both loading the value, it's converted correctly, and then actually calling the uh, system function, it's actually converted correctly again. So again, it prevents these errors from happening even across multiple steps. Uh, and again, if I try to ask for an incompatible unit, like unit of information, it's basically just going to give me a compilation error. Um, it will fail. Um, and uh, another example, which I think is possibly even more impactful, I was able to do the same kind of integration with Avro schema. Avro is cool because it allows you to uh, actually add custom fields. So here is a schema, and you can see on the right I actually added some unit expressions to annotate what units these values were. Um, and uh, Avro, of course, has a lot of potential applications. Um, Apache Kafka uses Avro um, optionally, and so does even, you know, Apache Spark. Um, so, um, you know, there's the streaming connection. The, uh, um, <clears throat> so, of course, Avro allows you to put values in. So I added so two new methods, uh, put quantity and um, allow you to basically say, okay, I'm not just putting a raw value, but I'm telling you how many units and what the units are. Um, and you can see these units are different than what I uh, actually had on the previous page. And again, it, the compiler does what it did before. It actually... Um, if I show the record, um, it did the numeric conversions properly. Um, and, you know, on the get side, if you're reading values out, it works exactly the same way. I can specify these values with the units, and uh, it actually gives me uh, the correct conversion automatically. And again, if I try to give it an incompatible type, it simply won't even succeed for me. Um, so I've been talking about like units that might be familiar to us, but um, here you can see, again, this is weird scala syntax. All I want you to take away from this is it's that easy to bring new, totally new kinds of units in, and you can actually use existing types. So like here's an example of maybe using Kubernetes pod and node types and bringing them in to the unit analysis fold. So you can see it basically there's almost no limit to the ways we could use this system. Um, I think there's huge potential here. So what have we done? Um, you know, we talked about like you know what units of measure actually are. Um, I demonstrated that you know errors in units can have real consequences and costs um, to those of us in the software world. And uh, I showed you know what it might look like to express units as types uh, in first class form along with you know like raw numeric types. And lastly, I showed like you know what you can actually use this for um, integrating with things like Avro Schema. Um, so, if you are interested in how this code works or actually wanting to try applying it, the project name is called Coolum. Um, as of about 10:30 last night, I finally got it building against the new Scala 2.13 compiler. Um, and in fact, it's. It's the only compiler version that this will work with, unfortunately, which I explain elsewhere in the code. But uh, that link will take you um, basically to a subsection on the README with a bunch of links to the API doc um, and of some blog posts. Um, and that was my pitch. Uh, thank you very much. So we have time for questions, if anyone has any. So my question is when maybe my background is Python and I like I like the cleanness of uh, when I was doing Java of defining all my types but I now in Python I also really like duck typing and using JSON without defining what data I, I expect. So when when does this become useful? What scale of project would I be looking at? I guess a one one time uh, project, one time script, probably not. Millions of document documents, probably yes. Do you have an intuition? Um, 
Well, uh, that's an interesting question of scale-wise. I mean, I'm going to talk briefly about Python, because as you point out, Python doesn't really have a static type system. It has a runtime type system. And so like, I, one thing I just want to briefly point out is, although I've been very focused on trying to do this at compile time with languages that support that, you could take the same system and do it at runtime. And so I've actually been thinking about that for Python. Um, Scale-wise, you know, as, as we all know, um, you know, things that we start out as being, oh, just a little prototype, have a way of, like, evolving into the live system while we're not looking. So, you know, I, my, my vision for this is for people to just use this stuff as ubiquitously and as reflexively as we do things like float and string. Um, so uh, my hope would be that, you know, this becomes um, used at all scales. Um, now, to be more realistic, I mean, you saw how I was doing configuration reading, you know, type unit type safety, and you know, I think that you know any any system complex enough to have a configuration, you know, for instance, could benefit from this. Um, Thank you very much for your contributions uh, and the talk. Uh, what is your vision for uh, units being captured on the database schema and the evolution of the database schema as the units um, evolve? Yeah, I've been thinking about that. I, my, my vision is you know, being, being able to extend that in the same way that I extended Avro. Um, now, the trick is, of course, Avro, I was able to basically you know, hack on a feature Avro already had in piggyback. Um, and, you know, a lot of these other schemas like Parquet or other database schemas, you know, that, that's not really an option. So, um, yeah, I don't see how to do that. I was able to do this unilaterally just on my own because of that customizable field. Um, other stuff would require me or the community going up to, you know, this projects and saying, hey, I'd like to add this. Um, you know, I I literally just got this working the way I wanted to in the last month or two. Um, <laughs> the, you you guys are my guinea pigs. You're the first talk, but like you know, this talk was like in some ways the first step towards me trying to see if I can drum up community enthusiasm and then maybe leverage that into you know extending, like you say, other other schema with this information. Yeah, obviously, like the unit and like the talk. Thanks a lot. Uh, what other languages would you think would support uh, static? Uh, like, Scala has more type system than any other language, I think. Uh, yeah. But uh, what? I mean, I guess C plus plus would support it. If C++ you work really hard. C plus <laughs> plus might. My C plus plus is so rusty that um, I hesitate to say. But I think it's worth. I, I think it's a definite possibility. Um, thank you for asking that. I was hoping somebody would ask that. Um, I was looking at Haskell. I'm about 90% sure you can do this in Haskell if you throw the right compiler switches, um, the right compiler extensions. And the one catch is I've never programmed even a line of Haskell, so it's very provisional. Um, Rust has a type class system, and this is fundamentally based on type classes. So. If it's got type classes and dependent types, which I'm not sure of, and if it's got um, chained implicit generation for type classes, <laughs> if it's got all that, I could do this. Um, I also think that, you know, I, I really like pulled out all the stops. I like used everything I could throw at it from Scala to do this. Um, I think there are simpler systems that would actually capture an awful lot of use cases that you could do. Without that, like I think even in Java, you might be able to express a certain, at least like simple units and ratios. Um, you know, you won't be able to get everything. You probably can't encode electrical resistance from first principles, but. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, atomic. Atomic units and unit ratios cover a heck of a lot of territory, and you could probably do that. Anyway.
So no, no more questions. If that's the case, could you all uh, give a, a clap of hands for Eric and his fantastic column? <laughs>